PRO Act, otherwise known as the Protecting Right to Organize Act, is a central part of the Biden administration's comprehensive labor and employment um, reform agenda. Um, even as a candidate, um, President Biden declared a, a sweeping objective to uh, change the nation's labor relations laws affecting the laws that govern unions and employers that deal with unions, um, like the National Labor Relations Act. That was a part of a much broader agenda that we won't be touching on here today, um, but is also included in some of the same legislation that the Biden administration is proposing. The PRO Act, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, is intended to do several things. It's intended to make organizing groups of employees easier for unions. It's also intended to make reaching a collective bargaining agreement with a company easier on the union side. And finally, it's intended to significantly increase the penalties for any violations of the national labor relations laws. The administration has declared that supporting unions and gaining, so to speak, market share for unions in the American economy is a very central objective. Uh, before he was president, um, President Biden was long time noted for being a supporter of, of unions in the American economy. During the campaign, he stated that he wanted to be the most pro-union president in history. Um, as a part of the work that he has been doing in the first 100 days of his administration, in addition to focusing on economy and um, environmental issues, uh, the Biden administration has devoted considerable effort, along with the Democratic Party in Congress, to promoting the PRO Act and the other associated pieces of legislation. This is an absolutely central goal of our current government. It changes the landscape and it grants in some ways a wish list that unions have had for some time uh, on things that they wanted to do in union organizing. More specifically, um, it would allow card check recognition, not just of unions as a potential bargaining agent for purposes of an NLRB election, but actually directly as the representative of employees. In other words, Employees could sign what are called authorization cards. Under today's laws, those authorization cards may lead to an election to determine if the union can represent the employees or not. Um, under the new laws, um, under the PRO Act, the card check would lead immediately to certification of the union as um, the collective bargaining representative if a majority of employees sign the cards. In addition to that, the sweep of union organizing is broadened. For example, uh, the PRO Act would bring back uh, an Obama era definition of joint employer. Under current law, joint employers have to have common control of labor relations, common actual control. Under the PRO Act, you can be a joint employer and subject to union organizing if you merely have potential control, which can be in the case of say franchisors, uh, corporate parents, brother, sister companies, and companies under common ownership that are actually independently operated. Furthermore, um, the, uh, the PRO Act would require that any company performing federal contracting work um, would have to sign a neutrality agreement, promising they would not oppose unionization of their employees. Um, in addition to that, the PRO Act authorizes not just representation of the, empl the, the employees at an employer that are, are the, uh, the majority of the employees all in a common unit, like a manufacturing plant, something like that, but it authorizes what are known as micro units. Those could be units of as small as two or three employees that might share a common interest in being represented by a union, fractionating the workforce and allowing the union to build a toehold from a very small number of organized employees. The uh, PRO Act also would permit organization of independent contractors by unions, and also would permit domestic workers to organize into unions. 
This is an area where the effect of PROACT uh, would be most, um, most dramatic. Currently, uh, if there's support for a union, the NLRB holds called a representation hearing and the union and the employer um, are heard before an NLRB administrative law judge on how the election will be conducted, who's entitled to vote, um, and those, those sorts of key issues. Under the PRO Act, uh, the employer would not be present at that hearing. Just the union and the NLRB would work out who's entitled to vote, what the ultimate bargaining unit would be, and the conduct and, and rules for the election. Beyond that, um, the act unbalances the communications between the employer and the employees and the union and the employees. Currently, the union can uh, talk to employees on non-working time, can talk to them in parking lots, can hold meetings and picnics and other events off-site, and can visit employees. The company can't do any of that, but the company can hold group meetings with its employees to explain its position uh, and to talk about what it believes are the benefits of having a union and, and that kind of thing. Um, under the PRO Act, those kinds of so-called captive audience speeches would be outlawed. So the economy would have effectively very little ability to communicate with its employees. Also under current law, companies can hire uh, either consultants that are experienced in labor relations or attorneys to assist and guide in compliance with the law and communications with employees. Under the Obama administration, a so-called persuader rule was adopted that would have required disclosure uh, and some limitations um, on the company's ability to hire those consultants and, and attorneys. That was ruled out of order by a federal court, but the PRO Act would readopt that disclosure rule and would inhibit the employer's ability to use a consultant or use attorneys to advise itself and guide itself in this process, exposing it probably to increased risk. In addition to that, the ways in which election can be conducted would be expanded. Traditionally, the elections are held at the employer's place of business um, during working hours. Under the PRO Act, the elections could be held in churches or McDonald's or by mail, uh, and in situations where the employer and, and the union normally would have the ability to both observe the election um, under the pact, it could be held in a situation where only the union um, could observe the election and make sure that it was being properly conducted. After an election occurs, the PRO Act uh, almost ensures that the union has the upper hand in collective bargaining. First of all, the employer would be, would be required to bargain within 10 days after the union is certified if the union makes a demand. After that, the parties have 90 days to reach an agreement. Now, for an initial collective bargaining agreement, that 90 days may seem like a long time, but really in practice, it's not. It takes a while to hammer out a brand new agreement, and it's not unusual for that process to take longer than this time span. Under current law, Either side may request and get the other side to agree to use the services of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service to act as a go-between to facilitate collective bargaining. But that's a mutual decision, similar to mediation in other contexts. Under the PRO Act, there would be mandatory arbitration of any remaining issues that cannot be resolved within 90 days. And what that would mean is the union, either side, can initiate arbitration if there still hasn't been an agreement reached. Either side then appoints an, a, a designated arbitrator, making two. Then you, those arbitrators appoint a third arbitrator, making three. Those three arbitrators then would hear something similar to a legal case with both sides presenting evidence about what they think the employees should or should not have or what the collective bargaining agreement should or should not contain. This probably expands the scope of the, of the knowledge the union has about the process and about the employer's uh, economic situation because it's kind of like a trial um, with witnesses and arguments. In addition to that then, 
the arbitrators don't act as go-betweens. They do what's called baseball arbitration, which is they actually dictate what the collective bargaining agreement would be. Um, and that collective bargaining agreement's binding for two years. Uh, and the employer then has their hands tied. So if an employer faces a union that has high demands and the union won't budge, the union can force the employer to go before the panel of arbitrators who decide the agreement, um, thereby kind of taking the thing off the bargaining table.